Welcome to Evolution Fast Forward podcast series on the synthesis of yoga by Sri Aurobindo. Now we are moving on to the third episode. In the first two episodes we have covered two necessities of nature, the need for yoga to rediscover and also what yoga is not as what we human individuals do but there is a vast yoga of nature both conscious and subconscious and our journey is part of that larger journey of nature evolving and various schools of yoga essentially utilizes powers of nature and there is nothing mystical and abnormal about it so already established powers of nature is used by different schools of yoga and harnessed intensified to create results that are way beyond what normal operates operations would yield and now with that he is coming to a concluding paragraph which is very very central to sri aurobindo's work and uh, let's explore in detail this particular last paragraph of the first chapter we are on the first part of the book first paragraph first chapter called life and yoga now let me read and those who do not have the book and those who are new i have put details in the description check out to find the books online or hard copy keep a book with you as a reference when you're listening but as in physical knowledge the multiplication of scientific processes has its disadvantages he is again comparing yogic science with material science as in physical knowledge the multiplication of scientific processes has its disadvantages as that tends for instance to develop a victorious artificiality not just artificiality a victorious artificiality which overwhelms our natural human life under a load of machinery now we are loaded with machinery so each machine is giving us one or other victory and freedom develop a victorious artificiality which overwhelms our natural human life under a load of machinery and to purchase certain forms of freedom to purchase certain forms of freedom and mastery at the price of an increased servitude so there is this two movements on one hand our motor cars our airplanes and all our internet computers they are giving us great freedom at the same time we become dependent on this machinery think of a whole week without electricity how it will be the present civilization will collapse without electricity we depend on machinery and there is a servitude to it not only that to run the machinery and the systems we have an economic system and that economic engine which is feeding into this cannot be stopped even when we discover that our economic engine and our technological progress is eating into our ecosystem and great deal of destruction is happening to the natural environment but our economy that has to support all our machinery we are dependent on them there's a servitude on one hand the freedom on the other hand servitude so to develop a victorious artificiality we feel like we have won conquest of nature and the speed with which things can be done so there is a victorious artificiality 
which overwhelms our natural human life under a load of machinery and to purchase certain forms of freedom and mastery at the price of an increased servitude. That's the challenge with science and its technologies. Now, what is happening with yoga? Why he is bringing in this? Let's find out. So, the preoccupation with yogic processes and their exceptional results may have its disadvantages and losses. Very important perspective. This is yogic processes and exceptional results may have its disadvantages and losses. What are they? And why is he bringing this out? So should we avoid it or should we pursue? Let's find out. The yogin tends to draw away from the common existence and lose his hold upon it. That's the first line he is saying. The yogin tends to draw away from the common existence. We find ourselves amid, amidst our common life, people, relationships, all that. Then we gradually wake up to a spiritual possibility. We become seekers. And then we start attending retreats. And those retreats demand you to withdraw more and more for longer and longer retreats. And the more you discover your inner peace, inner gladness, inner clarity. The more you withdraw from the life that is looking more and more like a stressful, messy world. And so a yogin tend to draw away from common existence. This is one of the major trend. Drawing away from common existence, from a common life you pull out, you step out and lose his hold on it, hold upon it. Not only you withdraw, but also you lose the hold on life, which is also often justified by this is all messy situation. I don't want to be in that. But you don't have any control, any mastery. You're withdrawing from life itself. The inner freedom by an outer death. You gain tremendous inner freedom. But there is an outer death. There is a decline of outer activities, creative expressions. There is a decline. You're gaining more and more inner peace, inner joy, inner fulfillment. But nothing outer. If he gains God, he loses life. If he turns his effort outward to conquer life, he is in a danger of losing God. Now, this is another common experience. You go for retreats, you have beautiful experiences, you come back to life, everything is lost. Life and its messy processes, its demands, weigh on you and you lose what you gained inwardly. No wonder people want to just withdraw. I'm done with this. So you gain God, but you lose life. Or you embrace life, you lose God. The divine consciousness within. So there is an incompatibility between these two movements. Therefore, we see in India that a sharp incompatibility has been created sharp incompatibility between life in the world and spiritual growth and perfection. So in Indian tradition, you see this whole segregation of the sannyasin and the householder. If you are a seeker, you need to renounce family, you need to renounce relationship, you need to renounce your worldly profession, you renounce money, you renounce life in general. 
and become a wandering monk or join an ashram for a highly simplified secluded life where you pursue your inner liberation your inner discoveries inner growth but you're gradually losing the grip over it so sanyasi is not expected to engage with the life and householder who is in this world of struggle and worldly battles there is this there are these two classes the householder grihastha and the sanyasi so india created this separation very sharp compartmentalization and although the tradition and the ideal of victorious harmony between the inner attraction and the outer demand remains it is a little or else very imperfectly exemplified so there is a tradition although the tradition and ideal of victorious harmony between the inner attraction and outer demands there remains if we look at very ancient india way beyond patanjali upanishadic age and vedic age we can see that the rishis they were lineages rishis had their children they lived like family brought up their children and made them rishis they guided kings the rishis were the most powerful people of the society they guided the society they were the counselors to the kings not only that even the kings were sages raja rishis janaka ajata shatru they are all examples or from mythology we know the story of shri krishna or if you look at jain traditions vast majority of tirthankaras who preceded mahavira were kings so there was this tradition and understanding and perception of this integral development of the inner and the outer the harmony although the tradition and ideal of a victorious harmony between the inner attraction and the outer demand remains it is little or else very imperfectly exemplified we do not have many examples very few or very little exemplified even the ancient memory of this approach was largely lost later when the monastic traditions began in india when the segregation of the monks the sanyasins and householder took place that's where the compartmentalization happened the other worldly spirituality emerged and this was a major error a limitation that happened in india and it's very important that we recognize this error limitation and the problem that it brings that you become more and more a recluse who is losing the control of life or mastery over life or you master life you lose your inner freedom and this is a fundamental challenge so what happened in india let's read through in fact when a man turns his vision and energy in word and enters on the path of yoga he is popularly supposed to be lost inevitably to the great stream of our collective existence and secular effort of humanity we can see that even today when a young person turns towards spirituality the rest of the family is worried now you're going to lose somebody and they don't want to lose in fact when a man turns his vision and energy inward and enters on the path of yoga he is popularly supposed to be lost inevitably 
to the great stream of our collective existence to our social life and social evolution, collective evolution, to all that, this person is lost. The whole socio-economic, political life, creative life, this person is lost. And is no more part of that great secular effort of humanity. Because the human society is going through its turmoil and going through its own evolution. The governance of the society, the economy of the society, the education within the society, healthcare within the society. There is a whole effort of the society to sustain people and live harmoniously. That effort to which you lose the one who turns towards that inner life. In fact, when a man turns his vision and energy inward and enters on the path of yoga, he is popularly supposed to be lost inevitably to the great stream of our collective existence and the secular effort of humanity. So strongly has the idea prevailed, so much has it been emphasized by the prevalent philosophies and religions that to escape from life is now commonly considered as not only necessary condition but the general object of yoga. And you can find these schools of yoga in India, schools of spirituality in India that looks at whole life as a misery, as a samsara or whole life as nothing but maya, illusion. And you are entangled, trapped, woven into it. And it is possible by the yogic methods to disentangle, pull yourself out and liberate yourself. And reject, renounce this whole world of becoming. Even end the cycle of rebirth as if rebirth is a punishment in which you got caught in this machinery of life. The very object of yoga became the search for the otherworldly, that which is beyond time and birth. So the escape from life is now commonly considered as not only the necessary condition, but the general object of yoga. This is a, a fundamental error and challenge in front of India and yogic traditions of India. Even when various yogic traditions and pathways and their activities seems to be intensely involving social involvement, social action, but if you study their philosophy, what is the aim of all this yogic life? Liberation, moksha, mukti. This world is an illusion. This is nothing but misery. So philosophically still carry that. So here we are touching upon something very, very fundamental and critical for the future of yoga. Not only the methods of yoga, but also the aim of yoga. No synthesis of yoga can be satisfying, which does not, in its aim, reunite God and nature in a liberated and perfected human life or in its method not only permit but favor the harmony of our inner and outer activities and experiences in the divine consummation of both. So if we are looking for a synthesis of yoga, rebirth of yoga. This is the first thing to resolve. We cannot have a satisfying solution that doesn't bring together the God and nature 
as long as we are looking at nature as an illusion, as maya, or as a misery, or as jetta, we are missing the point. So, no synthesis of yoga can be satisfying which does not, in its aim, reunite God and nature in a liberated and perfected human life. On one hand is liberation, liberated. On other side, perfected human life. There is a perfection that is required, that is sought in this collective existence and life on earth perfected human life. This dream had always been there historically. We humans cannot rest unless we find a greater harmony. Our social existence is highly imperfect and it is there is a search for greater perfection. So a liberated and perfected human life reuniting God and nature in a liberated and perfected human life or in its method not only not only permit but favor favoring what the harmony of our inner and outer activities so there is inner activity and there is outer activities we are constantly involved in outer activities there is same same time there are, there are inner activities going on we need to combine them, permit but favor the harmony of our inner and outer activities and experiences in the divine consummation of both, divine marriage of both inner and outer, that subjective fulfillment and objective fulfillment, both coming together, God and nature coming together material and spiritual moving together. It is necessary. Without it, any form of synthesis will not be satisfying. For man is precisely that term and symbol of a higher existence, descended into the material world. This is a very fascinating line. For man is precisely that term and symbol. What we are, materially, physical object, is a symbol. It's a term and a symbol of what? Of a higher existence. Now here the word higher, we need to dwell a little bit on it. In yogic tradition, with respect to our human mental consciousness and reference, there is that which is above and that which is below, that which is in front, that which is behind. There, is, there are ranges of consciousness above and ranges of consciousness below. Man is precisely the term and symbol of a higher existence descended into the material world. Now, descended into the material world, here again, this is not a metaphor. Again, these are structural keys in Sri Aurobindo's cosmology. Elsewhere, he refers to lotus. He says, the secret of a lotus is not to be found in the mud from where it is arising. It is in the heavenly archetype. It is that which descends here and materially express. So the basic notion is there is this material plane of our existence and beyond that there are non-material, more and more subtle planes of existence. There are higher planes of existence. And there are, from that higher existence, there is a descending movement into the material existence and materially expressing itself. So, Man is precisely that term and symbol of a higher existence descended into the material world. So here, this turns whole theory of evolution, Darwinian theory of evolution upside down. In Darwinian theory of evolution, man emerged 
from below, from matter itself, out of the animal evolution, the new latest prototype emerged through series of random coincidences and struggle for the survival of the fittest. It's an emergence from below. That's how modern scientific approaches looks at evolution. But that is, that is perhaps certain extent true with the evolution of the form, biological form. Nature is using those conditions of life. But from a yogic point of view, man is precisely the term and symbol of higher existence descended into the material world. There is birth into the material world. This is not part of the scientific framework. This is part of the yogic framework. And we need to treat it for what it is from a yogic point of view. In which it is possible for the lower to transfigure itself and put on the nature of the higher. So when the descent into the material world happens, in which it is possible for the lower to transfigure itself. So the biological system, the machinery, the wrapper, the body, it is transfiguring itself. There is something higher descended into it and put on the nature of the higher. So what is the lower? Our animal existence can put on something higher. First, human human possibilities and beyond human possibilities, the divine possibilities. But for all that, it is that descending movement that enables this transfiguration so that the lower can put on the higher expression. So different, so different from scientific approach to evolution and understanding of evolution, theories of evolution. This is from a yogic spiritual point of view. For man is precisely that term and symbol of a higher existence descended into the material world in which it is possible for the lower to transfigure itself and put on the nature of the higher and the higher to reveal itself in the forms of the lower. So the higher can reveal itself in the forms of the lower. So even out of the monkeys we are emerging. That emergence is facilitated by this descending into the molds that are ready to receive and then there is a transfiguration that happens. The human being takes birth out of existing lower forms and there is you become the human being and that's how the yogic sciences looks at the evolutionary process and also what goes beyond human. So there is this lower revealing the higher in it. But first it has to receive into it so that it can reveal and transfigure itself. So the material medium become a transparent robe to express that which is descended into it. To avoid the life which is given to him for the realization of that possibility can never be either the indispensable condition or the whole ultimate object of his supreme endeavor or of his most powerful means of self-fulfillment. So rejection and renunciation of life, whatever be the philosophical justification you have attached to it, it cannot be a condition, it cannot be an ultimate object. of his supreme endeavor or his most powerful means of self-fulfillment. It cannot be the means of your deepest, highest self-fulfillment. So, reading again, to avoid the life which is given to him for the realization of that possibility. So, life taking birth here is to realize that possibility. Avoiding that life saying that this is all illusion and the whole purpose of life is to get out of life itself. That is logically not making sense. So to avoid life which is given him for the 
realization of that possibility can never be either the indispensable condition or the whole ultimate object, whole and ultimate object of his supreme endeavor, the yogic journey, the spiritual seeking, the spiritual journey, or of his most powerful means of self-fulfillment. It cannot be. Now, this is so fundamental to Sri Aurobindo's teachings, so central to synthesizing of the yogic traditions. There is this aim of yoga and the method used for yoga or spiritual growth. Both must consider this inner and outer coming together. Not only the aim must conceive that, but also the method must conceive that. It can only be a temporary necessity. Even in our own individual journey, even in the very early stages, we need to take some time out of the immersion in the forgetfulness of mainstream life and go for some retreats and come in touch with something beautiful and deeper in us. It is a temporary necessity. That's temporary solitudes. But we need to go back to life and engage with life, take life in our hands and transform and perfect it. It can only be a temporary necessity under certain conditions or a specialized extreme effort imposed on the individual so as to pre prepare a greater general possibility for the race. So there may be, there can be some rare exceptional individuals, seekers, or those who are meant to open certain possibility for the whole race. For them, there may be a specialized extreme effort imposed on the individual, imposed by, let's say, greater divine will. And by the nature of the work, person has to isolate and engage in a deep work. If we can look at Sri Aurobindo's life itself, he was in the middle of freedom struggle for India. Then he withdrew. But it was a strategic withdrawal because he saw his mission was larger to engage with the world and its evolutionary crisis. And he withdrew into intense tapasya, developing greater and greater yogic capacities. And last 24 years of his life, he entirely secluded in his, into a room where hardly met people. But here, we should not confuse this as a solitude where he was only meditating, concentrating. No. Remember, the condition of victory where individual unites with the universal and transcendental. When a yogi unites with the universal and transcendental, his physical location of the body is secondary because one can operate globally even when you're sitting in a closed room. That's a very high yogic capacity and possibility. And highly extreme effort for opening up certain possibility for the race, for our species. So he had embraced himself upon a very intense sadhana, very specialized extreme effort imposed on the individual so as to prepare a greater general possibility for the race. So there may be exceptional individuals who need to take on such an intense effort in solitude, in isolation. But for general evolutionary purpose, we must look at integration of both. It, withdrawal can only be a temporary means, not a permanent condition or even an objective of yoga. Objective requires integration of God and nature. The true and full object and utility of yoga can only be accomplished when the conscious yoga in man becomes like the subconscious yoga in nature. There is a conscious yoga in man which is like 
the subconscious yoga in nature. Let me read again. The true and full objective and utility of yoga can be accomplished when the conscious yoga in nature in man becomes like the subconscious yoga in nature, outwardly conterminous, no, conterminous with life itself. Conterminous. Life and yoga are not separate. They coexist in the same space, in the same movement. Just like yoga of nature, which is subconscious. So yoga of man, which has to integrate these two. When the conscious yoga in man becomes like the subconscious yoga in nature, outwardly con contermini conterminous with life itself. And we can once more looking out both on the path and achievement, say in a more perfect and luminous sense, all life is yoga. This phrase, all life is yoga, is the master phrase, the mantra of the entire synthesis of yoga. All life, not only our individual life or the life of the billions, but life of the planet itself. All life is yoga. And we are nature's thinkers who can consciously accelerate the process. And we are utilizing various powers of nature that are already developed or in the process of being developed and taking them, making them focused, sharp and accelerating nature's own journey. An individual uniting with the universal, with the transcendent, through that nature uniting with her divine reality. That's the end of this first chapter. Four paragraphs. Title of the chapter is Life and Yoga. And it is ending with saying, All life is yoga. This is a view that is so profound and rich, all embracing. There is no rejection of life here. It's about fulfillment of life itself, life on earth and nature's purpose. Nature is evolving and she has created us as a self-conscious means to accelerate her own evolution. Isn't it a blessing to become aware of that process and to consciously collaborate with nature and to look at life, all the activities of life, the world energy creating, constantly remolding and remolding and recasting, pushing things beyond the boundaries. To look at all that is happening around as yogic unfoldment, the subconscious yoga of nature, and we as individuals can become the conscious instruments who can accelerate the journey. Just like a scientist would take up the electricity and heat from nature and create whole possibilities. Same way yogin can harness the powers of our psychological workings, the forces of our psychological workings. And therefore yoga is nothing mystical and it has its very systematic approach where Practical experimentation, analysis, constant result, consistent results, all that are part of the process. So welcome to the synthesis of yoga, chapter one. See you for the next episode. Meanwhile, remember, share your feedback, your suggestions for improvement, your comments, and what is helping you and what I can add more. And of course, subscribe so that we can keep in touch. Thank you.